is I don't want the class to cause stress. And I keep saying that, right? And so it is causing stress. So there's some problem here. There's some kind of suffering and some students think it's unjust and it's my fault, right? And I can do something about it, okay. And then I just go through the whole list of stuff. Okay, I can't lower the because that might make you happy tomorrow, right? It might be immediate. But if you graduate with a piece of paper, that's not worth as much as it was when you came. I don't think you would be very happy, right? So I'm, I'm still not assigning as much as I did when we were on campus. And Fatim and Aisha and Fatih. Fatima can actually attest to that, right? I gave them, I don't know, 25 posts or something, but they were shorter. Um, but I gave them, you know, I gave them more than twice as many posts that were half as long. So I tried to, I've tried to keep the standards because I don't want the reputation to go down. I mean, just think about it. It's more work for me but I don't think about that, right? Now, do you think some of your teachers are happy to do it because it's less work for them and then the students like them better and everything's peachy keen? For a while, right? <laughs> Everybody's happier until they're not. So I'm trying to think long-term, right? What's really in your interest long-term? Um, so, Here's the, all the things I do to try and reduce the stress. I have office hours. I, ex, you know, explain the assignments. I went over it, you know, recently. I mean, I don't want to be defensive. I just keep going through this and keep thinking, what else could I do? Because I'm not going to water down the class, right? So then the question is, you know, if you're examining the cause of your suffering, is the cause the teacher or is the cause the student or is the cause, you know, circumstances, right? I do think, you know, COVID, none of us caused COVID and we're all trying to um, correct, figure out how to function within that. Um, and I am sorry that at the beginning, with the button punching, <laughs> um, but I, you know, by the third week, I think I've gotten it pretty much into a flow. So there aren't too many breakdowns at that level. Um, so I, you know, I guess I can't figure out what else I can do on my end to have you suffer less. And then I just, like a therapist will do that. They'll say, well, what can you do, right? Do you have any agency in this, right? So then the therapist really, just like with counseling, all right, if you realize you didn't talk to the teacher, if you realize you never talked to your spouse and then can't figure out why there's so much stress in your marriage, you, <laughs> you should talk. Talk to your spouse, really. Um, so that's what I want to get across, um, and 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 there's a couple other things I'm going to do to try and show you that I'm I'm really going to try without bringing it down, right? So what I am going to do is we'll start the beginning of the class. What I want you to tell me in your next post: How many times did you come to class? and turn on your video and leave for 30 minutes or more, right? I do want to know that because I, su I assume it's done, you know, I do assume. But I guess I need an honest answer. The next question, how many times did you come to class without having read it, right? So I do want you to give me honest answers to that because that isn't my fault. <laughs> Okay, then the next thing is, I, we will start every class giving you 10 minutes 
to write down your three points if you haven't already come to class with those points, right? The only reason you wouldn't have anything to say would be because you didn't prepare. So then I am going to every one of you and you have to either talk or go onto the chat and say something. And if what you say is, I didn't come prepared, well, you said it, <laughs> right? So, I, and I don't think that should cause you stress, right? That's just absolutely coming, you know, like if you come to a job and the, and the, the employer tells you what you have to do when you come without being prepared, that's, so I, I can't hold your hand any more than that. So we will start every class with giving you time. And then I'll give you time during the class to write down stuff that you're learning from the class. So then you've got, you've almost got your whole post done right away. But I do want that final wrap up that what did I learn today that that I'm going to put in my final paper or not. Just some, when I read, when I hear the word utilitarianism, I have a thought because that's the one main thing I learned. So that, that's my teaching method is to try to put it in your long-term memory. So um, let's see. And then the other adjustment that I'm going to make is that the posts only have to be 350 words, not 700. I don't think it's that hard once you just start writing, but that's okay, I can do that. But I am gonna require a post every day because you haven't shown me that you're coming prepared. It doesn't mean you aren't coming prepared. So this is what the therapist would say know, you know, the therapist will say, how much time have you spent on that class? 50 hours. Does the teacher know that? No. You didn't tell her? You didn't tell her. No. <laughs> what did she say? She said that every student who posted said that they took three hours, which, or took, what, for a three hour class, you owe me six hours, right? Every single post says about three hours. So an hour per hour of class. That's what the teacher said. And the teacher thinks I've, to have a decent education for the school to have a reputation, you have to have at least an hour per hour of class. So as far as the teacher knows, she's doing everything right. Oh, but she's not. I worked 50 hours. You didn't tell her that. <laughs> but all my friends have worked 50 hours. Did they tell her that? No. Okay. So now to me, and my students do this at Lion, they create stress for themselves. It's like they set themselves up for stress. And that does happen sometimes. You get sort of addicted to it. So I understand that you might be in this sort of um, traumatic stress disorder, right? You might be to the point where everything seems stressful, and I understand. But you do have to reflect on that. Is the cause of the stress me? Or is it something inside of you where you just feel overwhelmed in general, and you want to find something to blame, which I understand. And that's why I'm trying to talk you out of it. <laughs> Just like in a marriage, lots of times, the other there's plenty of other causes. They always say, well, we argue about money. Well, it isn't really about money. It's about some other stuff, right? And so I hope you can figure out it really isn't the teacher that's the problem. There's a lot of other stuff. But what you have to do is communicate with the teacher. Right? So what you have to do is break down this wall that you've built where, you know, you're developing all these ideas without actually communicating. And, and a therapist, this is just this is like standard 
therapist's job. Did you ask the person? <laughs> um, I just, there was just some, something, I don't, I guess public radio, I listen. And it said they have this new kind of therapy called dialectical whatever. And this idea that if you have dialogue with people, all of a sudden your psyche gets better. <laughs> It's kind of like, hello, like that's what ancient people like Socrates. I, it's just crazy. How did we ever stop thinking that? We stopped thinking that with Kant and we stopped thinking that with Mill, right? So the modern world tried to kill this ancient notion of wisdom as dialectical. So one thing you could do, all of you, is ask yourself, Am I overreacting or am I underreacting or am I having the appropriate reaction to this class, right? And what is the cause of the problem? Is it me or is it the material or, and then what can I do about it? Um, so here, here's what I did about it, okay? That's what I asked myself, right? What else can I do? First of all, I'll give you time at the beginning of class and then you are accountable. I'll call on you. And if you just say, I pass, then, you know, I score you down. People keep telling me, well, just put points. In other words, threaten them, just make them scared. That's what I did not want to do, right? Because <laughs> I didn't want to cause you any more stress. I don't want to scare you. But, you know, let's just try this. And if students continue to pass and not say anything and not type anything, then I will use that old bludgeon, you know? Oh, you get fewer points. I, I really hate that because that's treating you like a little kid. Okay. Um, then I typed up to my supervisor. You know, I showed her the letter students sent and my reply, and I explained to her exactly what I do when I say, whatever you say, because you represent the college. I think I'm representing the college, but you're my boss. You've been at the college longer. You know what's going on. And so, um, so you tell me what to do and I'll do whatever. I, you know, I don't, have some kind of ego that if you take my class, you know, there are people like that. My classes are hard. I mean, I don't, I don't have that. My thing is, does my class fit the mission of the institution? And does it fit the reputation of the institution? And I will let her decide because she's been with the school for 10 years and she also knows what's going on during the COVID. And I will do whatever she says. I've asked her before should I water it down? And she said, no, but I'll, I'll ask her again. All right. Is there anybody who thinks I'm being unfair? Or just, is there, could you, so just for, I would recommend that you go through in your own mind, you know, why is it I'm associating stress with this class, right? And then how can I change that dynamic? Um, and how can I ask the teacher to help me change that dynamic, right? Without asking her to water down the class. That's, <laughs> okay, so that's, that's enough of that, I think, unless people have any other questions. It was much easier. I mean, the students who had me at school know that it's a very similar process, but it's just way different when I can't even see faces. I can't see any motion. We're not in a room together and all that stuff. But we all, you know, I want to make sure I, I adjust appropriately and I give you what you deserve, what you need, what's best. And if you have other questions or comments, um, just you can send me an email or you can whatever, but I have 
over and over and suddenly I get this email full of complaints that I don't know. I just, I'm not gonna water the class down unless my boss tells me I should. That's, that's all I can say. Okay, so this class, I want an honest answer. I assigned um, seven pages, not long pages. Then I assigned 15 pages of which the first four pages were just a repeat of the argument in this one. <laughs> so that's 22 pages, but it's about eight, 18 pages of um, new, you know, material that wasn't just repeating what you just read. Um, so considering this is um, over two classes worth, it's an hour and 40 minutes. Um, well, it's two classes, so that would be an average of about 10 pages per class during the semester, which I think is, you know, I think my boss wants me to assign 10 pages per class. So that all I'm telling you is that's why I assigned what I assigned. Um, so um, I'll give you some minutes to write down. I'll give you a couple of minutes to write down or remind yourself of what you read. And then of course, if you come not having read it, <laughs> you're at a more severe disadvantage, but I will do that and then I will call on everybody because basically I expect that you read it. Um, so I'll just give you a couple minutes and then we'll start talking. Okay, Saida, that's great. I mean, I'm happy to know that uh, things are breaking down and I, I understand all this stuff and that's why, you know, when I said there's a due date for the paper, you know, if you're not gonna get penalized if you hand it in late, it's basically, <laughs> it's the same as not having a due date, but the reason I have one is I do like to sort of plan ahead about when to read them, right? I can't get 50 papers the same day. You know, I tried to stagger them. Um, so I did have a paper due last week in my other class and nobody handed it in. So, you know, um, and nobody asked questions and, <laughs> Uh, whatever. So I, I don't know when I'm going to get all this dumped on me, but I'll do my best, you know, to, to help you out. Okay, so Sabe Kun, what you got? Um. I got nothing, Professor, because I haven't read. Okay. Okay. Um, what about Ashlyn? Um, professor, I couldn't go through everyone, like all of the material, but what when I have skimmed what I got is, um, the article was basically telling about what, like the first article was basically telling about what enlightenment is and um another thing is it, it is also telling something regarding the immaturity so that's some of the points i have noted but i couldn't completely go through the article okay um and then again 
you can tell me in your posts how much time you're spending on all the assignments, right? Okay. Um, Mosa or Rumi, I can't remember what you want me to call you. But anyway, what did you get? Okay, so is there something in the chat there? So Mosa, oh yeah, okay, there she is. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, I don't, all right, I can't get the message from Mosa, but all right. Diana, did you have something? Hi, Professor. Uh, Professor, I, I'm sick a bit, so that's why I couldn't go through the article. Okay, so I do have a question. Is it true that in your other classes, the 50 plus percent come unprepared? We have, we have a percentage on class participation. Yeah, okay. So is it true that you have to get, you know, penalized? Do I have to really put the penalty in there before people will come prepared? I mean, I really... Oh, no, no, Professor. Again, we're talking about a healthy psyche, right? <laughs> a healthy psyche doesn't just go on, you know, whatever, what, you know, Whatever they're scared of, they'll do, and otherwise they'll just goof off, right? So, so I think that a healthy psyche just, you know, makes the effort to stay on task or to pace yourself. And um, I understand all the obstacles. So that's every any time you have a legitimate outside beyond your control. I will never, you know, that's why I don't understand why the class seems so stressful um, because you can just count on me not to blame you for what you can't control. <laughs> but the question is, are there things you can control that you're not, you know, taking agency for? That's, that's what I want you to think about. That's what a therapist would want you to think about. Is there some way that you're bringing this on yourself that you could actually fix it? So that's just what I want to think about. Um, okay, so Maywish, do you have something? Uh, Professor, I just came through the, your article, which was about the United Model uh, Nations model about human capabilities. And um, the way you talk about the female expect that how women are considered as not capable of things. Okay, so I think we have, um, okay, so um, what's the date? The date's the 14th. Um, so uh, Tuesday, May 15th, sorry. Um, come having read Ruth Benedict and my paper about her article. 20 pages total. Actually, it's a little bit less than that. Be ready to get into groups and discuss, right? So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not, now I'm not, I don't even know if people are reading the right thing, right? So did you read, did you read Ruth Benedict and my... No. On. No, I, I didn't read Root Bandit. Okay, is that my fault? No. I mean, right, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I say, come having read Ruth Benedict and my paper, right? And here's, and you know that I try to, I, the reason why this is posted below is I try to introduce you to it 
so that you don't just have to read it without having talked about it or done anything, right? So usually I try to prepare, and I've done this, you know, for a number of classes to make things easier for you, right? So, you know, I, okay. Tell me what else I should do. Is there, is this my fault? Um, for me personally, Professor, um, it's been my fault entirely, but I've had a few circumstances which is why I could not concentrate on studies. Um, but uh, I want to, um, yeah, make up for the mistakes that I've made. So all I need is just a little more time. I think I can get over with all the posts and the assignment in eight or nine days. Um, that's what I want to do because I generally enjoy this class, which is why I show up every time and try my best to take part in the discussions. Um, what I want to do is listen to all of the YouTube videos again and read all the text because honestly, I've not been doing a lot of reading again. I have a few circumstances that I want to share with you after class just to give you a better picture of, yeah. Okay. So yeah, just a little more time. That's that's all I'm asking for. Okay. So in general, you know, I always I give students the benefit of the doubt, right? And I don't yell at them and I don't threaten them. But I I don't understand, you know, come having read Ruth Benedict and my paper. <laughs> I mean, what what else is there? that I could do is the question. Um, and that's okay. It's just that from now on, please read the stream and do what you're told. <laughs> or I'll get you. Like, oh, all right. I'll give you half for the day. I'll flunk you. I mean, I, don't, I just hate that. I hate that. My parents were never like that. So I mean, I was one of those kids who thought for herself and governed herself and, you know, never, didn't pay much attention to threats, um, but did a lot of things to avoid them, that's all. So, okay, Pooja, did you read it? Uh, professor, I, I did like, up to yesterday night 12, I was doing my sixth course and then I could remember all the things from that kind of like post. But like for now, uh, I was going through that immaturity from Kant and then which is he was telling like it is the inability to use one's understanding without the guidance of an other which I know, but I was uh, more interested to uh, read about the UN things and about the human rights and everything. So it was quite interesting for me. I was going through that. Okay, good. I just, um, I hope you can understand that, I, you know, students have to come having read it or we can't have discussion. And so I'm glad though, Pooja, I mean, I know you've been doing a lot and I appreciate it, um, but I don't know what students expect to get out of three hours of class, right? If they, so it's too bad because this is an article where I think students could identify with what's going on, right? I'm, I'm not just introducing you to this crazy theory like Kant and you're going, well, maybe that's not so bad, which is great, Pooja. I like, I like introducing you to things. Um, but anyway, we'll see how many people read it and then I'll have to piece together what I say based on that. Um, so Ritika, what have you got? Uh, sorry, Professor, I haven't read it. Okay, Isabel.
Okay. The other thing I will say that um, um, is that you do make it harder for yourself. I'm sure you know that, Sabi Kun, when you have to go back over stuff. Like, so when the students say, oh, I've spent 50 hours on this, I go, well, you know, you do have to remember that if you kept up with it, that, that's not the teacher's fault either, right? Um, so it's okay. I mean, I'm perfectly willing to take responsibility for whatever is my fault. Um, I just, I have tried, right? I rack my brain for stuff because I like, I do like to, um, to do everything I can. So, all right. Saida, did you say something in the chat? Let's see. Oh, oh. yeah, maybe wish. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, okay. And I am sorry for some of you who have gotten in over your head, and of course. Um, and, but, okay. All right, so Saida's behind, and again, it's fine. I'm just, I will patiently wait until things get done. And Fardine, unlike Fardine, so I know Fardine usually has things in, it's just uh, not today. So Masoma, did you read it? Uh, yes, Professor, actually I read it, uh, it uh, on Sunday's class. Uh, both the article, I mean, yours one, and also the outline about the Benedict rule. Okay. So again... Professor, can you have, yeah, yeah, Professor, I just want to mention something. Okay. Uh, that I think is not your fault at all. I mean, uh, of course, uh, as some of us has different circumstances and, uh, you know, it is difficult and that's why we are taking a stress, but it's not because you're, you know, the things or assignments in this class are more than any other classes but then uh, you know because of maybe uh, all the issues that uh, personal issues that some of us might facing uh, we are taking a step but then I'm saying that your class is very interesting I really enjoy honestly professor I really enjoy all of the topics that we are discussed and I really like you know to write this reflection but then uh, yeah because of the other issues or maybe because of the circumstances we are, uh, we send those emails and then you are stressed. Uh, I don't know, but it's not, I mean, it's not your fault and it's all about, the, this is our, in our side. And, and well, I think, you know, uh, the assignments are not, not I, think, I mean, I, not. I think we all should agree that we have, there's a lot of stuff that, of your control, right? We go back to that suffering thing. Um, I mean, let me just tell you that it is crazy, but COVID for me has been a huge blessing. And I've suff I suffer a lot less because of COVID. <laughs> okay, then that's not fair, right? Hey, Professor Beck, that's not fair. But that's why I'm so willing to bend over backwards, right? Because I'm in such a different place than and it, you know, it just makes me sad that it's not coming across that way. Um, so I stopped writing and I've written for 20 years. And in my mind, what I'm writing is those professional philosophers. I, I hate them. I despise them. And they're letting my democracy, you know, get lost because they're not doing anything and they should be doing this and they should be doing that. And I just... After COVID, I just said, stop, you know, stop. Stop arguing with them. They do not care. They are not listening. And so, so you know, COVID's been good for me. <laughs> but um, I know that you have all these things and they aren't, you know. But if you could learn how to think it through the way a therapist would ask you to think it through, which is, what agency do you have, right? You can make a list of all the things you can't control, you didn't control that are worse. That's fine, make the list. But over here, you have to make the list 
of your own agency. Like, what can you do, right? What can you control? And I want me to be on that list, right? <laughs> I want to be on that list. I can control, you know, this, my, you know, my grade in this class to some extent because my teacher is not going to punish me, right? And so I just want to make sure I'm on the list of things you associate with your own agency, right? That's my You are on the list, Professor, you are. <laughs> but, but Masoma, you know, on the stream, I said, I'll just go over Benedict. So you didn't need to read it for Sunday. And so again, somehow what's happening is that I'm trying to bend over backwards to help you and it's turned out making it worse. And I've done that many times before. <laughs> um, but it, but I, I figured after the first couple of days, people would sort of get the hang of it that, but, hopefully from now on, right? I usually post, you know, the thing that we're covering for the next day, I post it ahead of time so that I can do a quick half hour survey. And then the next time, and I usually put in the description, this is what we'll cover. But anyway, um, I also posted a week ahead of time and that was stupid because that really, <laughs> uh, no, Professor. I mean, that was okay because you mentioned on the other post that we will discuss Benedict and this time, right? But then I read that one because I thought that, okay, we might got time to discuss this one, so I should okay. be prepared for it. And then I read it and, and it was, you know, make it easy for me. So for today's class, I had nothing to read. I have, I mean, there was articles that was optional. I could read those and then I have time to read those because I already was... Uh, you okay, know. so you were you were aware of what? Okay, good. So yeah, what, was, yeah. what was your reaction, Masoma? Go ahead. You've got like lots of time. <laughs> uh, my reaction to what, Professor? To the article, to Benedict, and to my response, Professor. Honestly, uh, I first read Benedict article, and I was saying that okay, she was true. She was saying that you know. Uh, culture is, you know, culture different in every societies, and uh, uh, and we cannot change this, and we cannot blame those because if I were in that society, I also have similar culture. So there is no, you know, good culture or bad culture in these things. And then, uh, but when I read your paper and I saw, okay, there is a lot of issues that we should consider this, and and I was like, how you come up with this point? <laughs> And then uh, those were, I found those were convincing and strong and valid. Uh, we should consider those points. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed reading your paper, Professor. Okay. Uh, I, I had some points, Professor, in my mind when I was reading Benedict. I mean, uh, some of the points that I was disagree. But then when I read your paper, I thought that all of this are valid and, and <laughs> we should consider, yeah. Good. I mean, we can go through it in class. I just kind of wish if people had just read it, it would be it would be better. But I, I will be able to handle it. So between you and the ones who've read it, we can. I think we can generate some mental energy here. So, um, so Marjana, what about you? Are you there? Yes, Professor. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't go through the... Okay, what about Falak? Professor, I haven't read it. Okay, what about Jana Tool? Jana Tool, are you there? Uh, Supti? Uh, 
Did you read it? Hello? Okay, Rita? Rita? Okay, so if your microphone doesn't work and the chat works, please put something in the chat. Uh, Christina? Sorry, Professor, I haven't read it. Okay, now. Now? Uh, uh, professors, for me, I have read just a few, uh, like one of your posts and the other about whole, uh, Benedict one, just a little. Yeah. That's fine. Did you have a reaction? This, this re reaction is about like natural is, natural happening is just the happening that we should allow. And then uh, the main problem is by ourselves. Like, I don't know how to say. Okay, so Saida, did you have something? Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an assignment right now, all right? Um, to describe her article. Um, and I'm going to... You know, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a 10 minute break, but I'm gonna describe her argument. And then I want you to come back with something to say, some reaction, because I know you've thought about this before. <clears throat> so how many think that the values people have are the result of their social conditioning, right? So you remember Ben, remember Mill, and Mill said, people's conscience or sense of good and evil is all a matter of conditioning. So that's basically what Ruth Benedict is, is saying, okay? And she gives, is everybody, everybody should understand that because that must have occurred to you that the reason why you have the values you have is because you grew up with those and your parents instilled those. Um, okay, I would hope you at least argument, right? So this is just, Ruth is taking from the utilitarian playbook and the utilitarian worldview. And from that view, the discipline of anthropology, the social sciences, all those branched out. They all sort of started after the enlightenment. Aristotle doesn't have social science because <laughs> he doesn't think people are their behaviors, he thinks people are their ideas. The fundamentally different view of human nature. But anyway, so Benedict says that. And here are the examples she gives. Okay, you guys, write it down. And so I want you to take notes. Her conclusion is that morality is a convenient term for socially approved habits, okay? What's considered normal and moral? Okay, morality is a convenient term for socially approved habits. People behave a certain way. They get rewarded for it and they call it morally good, right? They behave a certain other way. They get punished for it, right? The good old Bentham, pleasure and pain. They get punished for it and it gets called bad, 
naughty. Okay. Now, how many of uh, I want you to just think how many of you have that thought has occurred to you before? <laughs> Write down, go ahead. Write that down because uh, each of you are going to have to talk. Okay. So the example she gives, okay, write this down to think about. And you're going to just have to do it shorthand. I'm going to describe the examples. And you're going to have to just write, jot down. Okay, one of them is homosexuality. Okay. And this was, she wrote in 1934, I think. Yeah, 1934. She said, in the West, if you show any signs of homosexuality, you are considered abnormal and evil, right? You will experience all the problems of a person that's not socialized, right? But in these islands in Greece and in these other places, there's a burdash, there's a role for those people. They're accepted and they have a certain place and do certain things. I think it's oh, cooking, housework, something. But mostly they're totally accepted. Oh, your kid is one of those. Okay, well, then they go there and they're perfectly accepted. Okay, so homosexuality is one of them. The other one is in India, she says. The experience of ecstatic religious experience, right? Mystical trance. That's considered, you know, that's something people seek and it's something they honor in their religious leaders, right? So people who can do that are particularly respected. Whereas in the West, <laughs> you're in deep doo-doo if you do stuff like that. Okay, so what I say to my American students when I'm teaching this, I say, what would happen if on Monday you said to your friends, I had a great weekend. I stared into space all weekend in a mystical trance. Would they think, oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> okay. So what she says is, obviously, if you're conditioned to value it, you can learn how to do it. And if you're conditioned not to value it, not only do you not learn, but you call it bad, right? It's not a virtue, and you might even call it a vice. You're just lazy, Professor Beck. You're just lazy. <laughs> If you stared in a space all day, you're lazy. Um, okay, that's the second example. Third example was uh, there's a tribe that lives on an island and their food source is yams. And during the season, when they, when they harvest the yams, they protect their yams and they're like what we would call paranoid. They think everybody's gonna steal their yams and they they never have collective din dining or anything because they're just like completely uh, paranoid about this. And um, they think every once in a while, one of them just goes crazy and just starts sort of taking out a knife and going after people because the paranoia gets so extreme. But there's one person in that society that has this wonderful sunny disposition and they absolutely can't be paranoid and everybody thinks they're crazy. Okay? All right. So in our society, if you acted like that, you would be sent to the loony bin. <laughs> right? Um, and then, but if you act with a sunny disposition and Jesus loves you and all that, it works out just fine, right? You're considered really a nice Christian girl or a nice positive, right? Positive psychology, oh, goody, goody. You would be, you know, thought of as just wonderful. <laughs> See, I wish all of you had your videos on and I could make you laugh. 
I really do. I I would <laughs> I want to make you laugh, and I'm not making you laugh. Obviously, I'm scaring the heebie-jeebies out of you. So, um, all right. Then there was the last one was that this tribal chief. Um, uh, some of his family members went off to um, for some, they had some errand to do somewhere, and they ended up dying, right? It was his sister and his sister's kid or something. And so the chief, uh, you know, the question is, am I going to just let that go or I'm going to make sure that somebody pays? So the chief goes, someone's going to pay for that. And he gets together a war tribe and they go off and kill seven people and then they feel better, right? Whereas in our society, of course, you kill innocent people. You're, you're in prison forever, <laughs> right? So that's completely unacceptable in Western. So normality, what's considered normal and what, what's considered moral is just social conditioning. And we are all completely plastic except for these you know, a few dispositional traits that, that seem to be genetic. But that, that was what John Stuart Mill said, okay? So that's differences of temperament occur, right? But most people are plastic to the way they're being conditioned, okay? Now, one more point, each culture um, is a more or less elaborate working out of all these potentialities, right? A culture will pick a couple of them and just keep feeding and refeeding and reinforcing that. So a good society is well integrated and consistent with itself. So a little kid grows up imitates everybody around them, is told how to behave. What they're told is the same way that people behave. Everybody behaves the same. That is a well-integrated and consistent society. That's a flourishing society. The more integrated the society is, the more, uh, the more, well, anyway, that's enough for now. So now I'm gonna give you a break but I want you to come back with some thoughts. Do you agree with this or not? All right, I'll give you, it's 10.06, my time, it's six minutes after. So I'll give you till 15 minutes after, but come prepared, okay? And you can think of examples in your society where you've been conditioned a certain way. You know, you can think of what are the prevailing habits and how do they, go ahead. You must have ideas about that. Okay, go for it, guys.
Um, can someone repeat to me what Professor said at the end about uh, a society or a culture being well integrated? I guess basically if the society, what she meant to tell what I understood is that if the society is integrated and everyone is having that kind of integrity among themselves, then it actually helps in the flourishment, something like that. So we have to reflect our idea on that. But then something about the child, right? Child? Um, yeah, a child growing up and then the child imitating the people around him or her. Um, professor, I was asking um, what you mentioned at the end about the society being well integrated and being consistent. Um, I uh, didn't quite catch that, but can you briefly? Well, yeah. What do you think, you know, when someone says the society is well integrated, well, what do you think they mean? Really, you can figure. Yeah, I think it includes Inclusivity, something to do with that? With what? Or maybe inclusivity? I think well, that's the word. Actually, what she, I mean, her examples were the chief gets to go kill people, right? If his family gets killed, right? Or um, you wouldn't think <laughs> that you don't associate that with inclusivity, right? Um, so there's a lot of huge inequality in that society. Um, the society where people are paranoid about their yams, right? That was a very well integrated society, but it was not an inclusive society, right? I mean, everybody excluded everybody else. <laughs> so integrated just means everybody agrees on what good behavior is and what bad behavior is, whatever that behavior is. Does that, okay, does that answer your question? Okay, and that's an important distinction, really. Okay. Um, let me... All right, so it's just about time. I hope everybody has something. And give an example, right, of some um, from your own experience of how, you know, you're, okay, so here it is. We pick students from as many different countries and as many different backgrounds as we can find, right? Um, so first step, do you think morals are relative? And so have you been conditioned? What have you been conditioned to think, right? Or do? And um, is your society well integrated? so that everybody agrees on these certain values. So Ashlyn, can you, what do you think? Do you think that's what a well-integrated society is? Do you think people's ideas of moral and normal are equivalent to socially approved habits? What? Um, so what I have noted down is that, um, there are certain things that are said to be moral and normal according to the according to certain concepts that we used to follow from the very beginning or we were taught to follow. But I don't necessarily agree that what people give definition for a moral or a normal thing is actually a moral and normal thing to other people. So there is a chance of a chance of this contradicting ideas. Uh, which we which we should do, uh, which 
which takes me back to the idea of John Stuart Mill's free and open society. So this free and open society is a platform where I guess the healthy psyche or the flourishment of an individual as it is starts, right? So if there are something, for example, uh, just taking my country in context, then once we are born, if we, we, once we are born with a gender or we are assigned with a gender, we are given certain gender norms. For example, uh, girls, they are told to be emotional, whereas boys, they are told to be rational. And girls are supposed to do certain things or girls are supposed to wear uh, dresses that they don't even like. Uh, they don't necessarily like, but they are assigned with a particular dress code. And boys, if they, for example, if they grow their hair long, their hair long, that is not uh, tend to be normal. It's just something odd. If you, if boys grow their hair lo uh, long, it's something odd. So what they consider or what the society assign normal, something so-called normal may not be the thing that as an individual or as a particular person we might like, right? So I guess uh, what the society assign themselves as something moral cannot be generally accepted as the so-called normal things, Professor. So there should be this uh, open um, floor to contradict to the ideas that the society already put uh, in order to initiate our idea of being a healthy psyche. So that's what I think. Do you know what your problem is? Yeah. Sorry? You've been corrupted, okay? So yeah. AUW has corrupted you totally, <laughs> right? Ah, uh, it's hopeless. You're hopeless. Don't go back home. You get killed. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sabe Kun, yeah, I'll get to that in a minute, but I hope you realize, right, that um, this is problematic. Okay. Okay. Sabe Kun, what do you think? Um, professor, I want to start by reacting to something that Ashleen pointed out, and that is. I think the term is social engineering, how when we're born, we're assigned with a gender and we're expected to act and react a certain way and live a certain way in life. So my question is, if gender is a part of social engineering, if the kind of color you like or is enforced on you to like is also a part of social engineering, basically um, what I understand is you're trying to say you could have lived life differently if you weren't forced to act a certain way from such, from such an early age. And it brings, I mean, it, sorry, that's, that's my <laughs> pet rooster. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the, um, rooster, the rooster disagrees. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, so I want to ask if, Sexuality too is a form of social engineering. <laughs> Disagrees, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so. he's a rooster. <laughs> Roosters are not chickens, and I'll show you why. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, so I want to ask. I want to know, Ashley, and what do you? Th excuse me for all the crowing in the background. I want to know, Ashley, what you think about sexuality. Do you think people, I mean, what, what do we understand by the term sexuality? Does it mean, you know, a natural form of sexual attraction for the purpose of procreation? If, if that's the case, then it would make sense that heterosexual is the normal kind of sexuality. And if you think it's something beyond that, then what do you think is normal or is socially engineered kind of thing? I don't know if I'm making sense. But anyways, what do you understand by sexuality, firstly? And number two, do you think it's a part of social engineering and people could have evolved differently or structured society or culture differently if they understood or if they know inherently that it is a part of social engineering? So yeah, two questions. Um, uh, yes, yes, that's a, uh, that's a very good question because, you know, um, sexuality, what I partly think it's, it's a part of the kind of social engineering, I guess, because, uh, you know, 
the people who are assigned with the uh, for example if the people who are assigned as a gen uh, like a male or a female or something like that so we we can see cases like where people when once they start thinking or reasoning or when they ask themselves about their sexual orientation or anything to their mind or brain itself they are coming up with their sexuality right but what what actually is assigned from their beginning is like it is normal you are assigned with this gender so you are supposed to attract the opposite the so called opposite gender so that's a part of uh, the social engineering part you told i guess but once when we start as i have already told once when we start reasoning or once we start exploring on our sexual orientation or ourselves and when we find something which is which is not you know equivalent to the so called normal but what we see is it is un, it is not accepted it is something very odd so i guess that's basically a part of the uh, childhood conditioning or the idea of being told you are supposed to attract to the opposite gender that is how the societies or that is how things would work but uh, yeah i uh, to answer your question i guess that's a kind of social engineering too because there are people coming when they start thinking themselves there are people coming uh coming up exploring their social orient uh, i mean sorry sexual orientation and yeah. Yeah. yeah that actually makes sense which uh, which answers to your question that would be a social part of yeah. the social engineering yeah. i don't know I, i've answered your question yeah um, yeah that makes sense um so that that perfectly aligns with the reactions that i've written down and so you mentioned that I think what you're getting at is that morality can be relative. So the western society is um increasingly accepting um homosexual people and non-binary people, but whereas south asian people are finding it very difficult still to grapple with the idea and also being criminalized in the process. um whether for good or bad i'm not sure but anyways my first reaction is professor mentioned morality is a convenient term for socially approved habits and i don't i personally don't think um it's just a convenient term i think um i think because i'm always trying to think in from a more black and white scientific approach i think that perhaps you know what the rules and regulations we see today or the culture that we see today um it's due to we must have had a more innocent beginning i think you mentioned one time that the road to hell you know is made of good intentions so this corrupted culture i mean it originated from a more pure kind of intention so i think in the past um as aristotle mentioned that uh it's inherent for people to look for patterns and recognize patterns and um structure their life in a way that they don't have to rely on luck they can react intelligently and you know have a better chance of surviving i think due to that pattern recognition ability we were able and and the development of memory and passing down intelligent information to the um following generations we were um yeah we were able to basically recognize pattern adapt right we could adapt to the physical world a lot better Oops. <laughs> She died. That rooster got her. <laughs> the rooster punched the button. <laughs> Shut down her machine. I might might be disagreeing with all the points that you're telling so I want to show okay. you. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to I'm going to move on to Diana but I'll hold everything, you know, keep it all in mind here. Okay, Diana, what you got? Professor, I got that <clears throat> I I do agree with Ashlyn 
because the society that I have grown up, so I have seen how they are, um, they are relate, they are relate, relating everything based on the gender. Even uh, the small things which is not relate on the gender, but still they are doing like even the colors that they have uh, categorized that blue is for boys and uh, pink is for the girls. So it all shows the mindset and the uh, beliefs on the gender. And I have seen in the article it was written that women is not raising their points, I think. I just saw in the in the article uh, that they are not raising their voice and they are always to accept what others say. Uh, I mean the domination part that they are being patriarchy, I think. So that is showing the gender-based things. Okay, so, yeah, that's not the article you were that we're talking about. It is Prof the article that was posted, but that, that's the one that I just wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, the main thing is the Benedict. And so, um, yeah, I, I hope you start getting the rhythm of it, which is... I'll Professor, I just found in here it's written that homosexuals are afraid to uh, complain. If they come out, they risk violence, yeah, job discrimination, right. house discrimination in its sea. So I was just um, trying to yeah. point out this... Yeah, Diana, it's it's true. It's just that I I wanted us to start out with the the view that everything's relative and then move on to that argument. Um, okay. But that's okay, Diana. Just keep it. Just that it's kind of you know I did organize the class so that you sort of go <laughs> step by step. Um, mm -hmm. So that's good. We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, Isabel, do you have some reaction to? Just what I said, just the example she gave, the conclusion she has that, that we are plastic. Most of what we think is right and wrong and normal is just a result of conditioning because we were a blank slate, we were plastic. Um, what do you think, Isabel? Okay, I will, I will sort of wait just a couple seconds and then I'll get back to you if I, you know, uh, if you come up later. And Masoma, I'm going to put you on hold so that everybody gets a chance to talk, okay? Uh, sure, Professor, but I just want to mention that Isabel mentioned in the email, uh, sorry, in the chat box that she has, uh, her microphone is not working. I mean, uh, in pre previously okay. when you asked that way, there's... Uh, yeah, we did yeah, okay. So um, I think she have yeah. Okay. What about um, Marjana? <clears throat> yes, Professor. Um, I just like to I just like to add to what just um, Ashleen mentioned. Um, it's about assigning someone uh, assigning a child with a gender. Uh, from the time we are born. And uh, uh, it's all about our liking and disliking, that too. And another thing is uh, as well as about uh, religion as well. Um, so when we are born, we are assigned with a certain religion. And, um, you know, when uh, in our school as well, we are um, supposed to take uh, our religion as a subject in school. And uh, from that time, we are um, aware that we are different from that person. Like she is Muslim and I am Buddhist. And um, that actually, um, I think is, uh, and uh, another thing that um, it is not normal to, uh, for me to like a Muslim guy, you know, uh, to have an interest on a Muslim guy as a Buddhist uh, girl. So yeah, that's also a part of, you know, uh, social condition, I think. Okay, good. Jana Tool, do you have something? Okay, Rita?
Okay. Oh, hello, Professor. Um, I also agree with Marzana because uh, as, you, as we know that Indonesia is the most populous uh, Muslim in the world. And <clears throat> sorry, something like homosexuality, is, it's uh, taboo in Indonesia. And people with this uh, sexual orientation is uh, considered as, uh, they are not accepted in the society. So it's really hard for them to be to, to except, talk to except about. Except in Bali, where the Hindu. Yeah, yeah. Right. And also yeah. in Jogja, there was a restaurant in Jogja on the second floor, third floor, whatever. And the hostess was a transgender person. Um, so there is a Hindu um, tradition of a third, a third sex. And Hinduism does allow for it, but um, I I would guess, Rita, that most a lot of Indonesians don't even know that because um, Bali is mostly Hindu, and so it's okay over there. But it is interesting that you say that because I've eaten at a, a restaurant in Jogja where it, you know it's obvious, like this person is flamingly so they're not trying to hide it. But um, I, I I guess that's interesting that. There's also, um, in um, Bandung, there's a certain uh, stoplight where the traffic is so bad that you get stuck for about half an hour at the stoplight. And then there's a whole lot of these third sex people that are um, playing music and stuff and trying to make some money. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know if you knew that, but again, most, it's 88% Muslim and so I would gather most people have that attitude. Um, so um, now, okay, what Benedict's argument is that people are molded and a well-integrated society is one where everybody's molded the same and they all agree. And so then life is easier and the society is well-structured if it's well-integrated with itself. So what do you think, Falak? Okay. Okay, Puja just lost electricity. That's fine, you know, these are things nobody can control. We're okay. Um, don't, don't let it get to you. Um, Falak, are you there? Nope, she disappeared. Okay, Fardeen. Um, yes, Professor. So um, after hearing you speak about this, I was thinking that uh, I also feel like what our perception of morality or what is normal is largely influenced by social conditioning. And uh, I think the first time I realized this was uh, when I was about 15. So when I was 15, I moved to Bangladesh from um, Saudi Arabia, where I spent a huge chunk of my childhood and uh, like moving to like between two different, very different communities really like drove that point home. So I lived in a very small city where, um, so all the women, they wore this thing called the niqab. I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but it's basically after you wear the baya and the headscarf, you wear another piece of clothing uh, and only your eyes are visible. And actually, for some women, even the eyes were invisible. Uh, like they could see uh, through yeah, the niqab, but they couldn't see their yeah. eyes. But that was the most normal thing there and was just what was expected. Even if people didn't necessarily do it for religious reasons, it's just what everyone did. And there was nothing um, weird or negative about it. But then when I moved back uh, to Bangladesh, I started to notice that people have quite a different perception of that here. Um, it differs among different communities in Bangladesh, but still it's like, it was not at all the same as uh, it was when I lived in Saudi Arabia in that city. And it was like no longer like sort of a measure of normalcy or, <laughs> well, I guess morality in some communities, but like generally not so much uh, yet. So, yeah, I think we're definitely influenced by social conditioning a lot. Okay, Falak, you're back. You want to say anything? 
Oh, she disappeared again. Every time I call at her, she disappears. Okay. She has some kind of rooster in her electric system. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see, Masoma, you want to comment? Uh, yes, Professor, sure. Professor, I have a lot of things to say, but I think we don't have that much time. And I don't want to take other others' time, but I want I want to be short. So, uh, I mean, I'm completely disagree with what Benetan is saying that morality is equivalent to the social construct norms. I mean, uh, I'm agree with Ashlyn in this point that, okay, we have certain norms which are, you know, we think uh, those are morals and those are normal in the society, but it's not necessarily moral. If we think, uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's not necessary to be, I mean, those social norms are not necessary to be moral. I mean, it's not, I mean, not all people would agree on this. And then uh, uh, what Benedict was saying, I think uh, she was really, uh, you know, undermining the human reasoning ability. So she was saying that, okay, we are plastic. We are a human being are plastic. They, are, they can be molded in certain ways. And then if she agrees on this point, it means that I'm not responsible for my actions and my behavior because I'm brought up in, like this in this society. Uh, what is my different from the other, uh, you know, living beings or non-beings even? So uh, if I don't have any responsibilities, I mean, if we have this idea, if we adopt this idea and, and, and if we accept it, then we should agree that I don't have any responsibilities for my actions because I am brought up in, like this. Uh, and then I think this is a serious issue. And then I'm completely disagree with her point that a well integrated society is, you know, a good society. Uh, <laughs> because if she's saying that, you know, moral is, is uh, you know, more morality is something uh, socially constructed and we don't have any, you know, right and wrong moralities, uh, then how can she say that we, if, uh, about, I mean, well integrated society? So which society is well integrated? I mean, which norm we will adapt? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but then Professor, uh, I think this is not a good idea at all uh, to be. I mean, certain norms are, you know, um, uh, not morally good. Uh, even in our society or any other society. So let me give an example of homosexuality. Homosexuality, uh, the, uh, I mean, back then, you know, many centuries ago, it was, you know, a good thing. I mean, it was honored maybe in Asian countries, in India. Uh, it was practiced in Afghanistan but not in the Western countries. But now it is legalized in the Western country and it is criminalized in the Asian countries and in South North Professor. So if we are saying, okay, homosexuality was, you know, uh, everyone was okay with this practice and then uh, now it is criminalized, but then it wasn't criminalized in the, it was criminalized in the Western, but it is now legal. So, is it like we are saying that, okay, Indian peoples, you know, went to USA and live there and all of the USA people come to India. Uh, that's why it's not, I mean, uh, Professor, did you get my point in this? <laughs> so, so I think so. And I, I know that, I mean, I can tell that you read the article because I'm not quite sure that the students really understand what her point was because, but anyway, matter. So I understand so much. So let's go through. I'm going to go through her reasoning. All right. Now let's yes. He follows John Stuart Mill. Okay. And I, I mean, I think we should use the examples of the yams. All right. There's a society where everybody's paranoid about their yams, but they all agree, right? It's a very well integrated society. Nobody Everybody expects everybody to be what we would call paranoid, right? But they are yes. normal, right? And moral. If somebody doesn't watch out for their yams, they are socially, you know, booted out of there. They're evil, right? So let's use the yams and let's use the head hunting because that's the farthest from anything that's problematic to most of you, right? Does that make sense? 
it, uh, yes, Professor. Let's let's use those other two examples because um, it makes her point clear. The yam, the yam paranoia society is perfectly internally consistent, and everybody agrees. Okay, the head hunting, where the chief. You know, if somebody in his family dies, he goes out there and kills a few people and feels better, right? And everybody agrees, okay? So let's get that in your head. Because that's evidence that societies, um, that normal and moral is just socially approved habits. So if the chief didn't go kill somebody, he would be no longer the chief, right? I mean, that would be not fulfilling his role, that would be immoral, and he'd be out. Okay, so let me, so let's just go through this. I have this whole line of reasoning here, and I want you to think it through, okay? Just think carefully, step by step, because a lot of, you know, what I ask you to do is just what I call a line of reasoning, right? So here we go. Um, no, this is not it. Sorry, I punched the wrong button, which I always do. Uh, I'm always punching the wrong button. Um, here we go. All right. What does Benedict think is real, right? Empirical data. Does everybody get that? She all doing is looking at the data especially social groups, right? She's an anthropologist. What is the data about these social groups? I am not making moral judgments. I am just recording the data. And the data says that whatever everybody does is what they call good, right? And everybody, okay. Masoma, go ahead. Uh, professor, I mean, the example that she gave is not exclusive. I mean, she gave only three examples. And, and what about the other societies? I can I can give the examples where uh, th this data would be, I mean, this empirical data that she is referring that, okay, the, uh, based on this, he's conclude that, you know, social norms are our moral norms. It's constructed and all. But then... Uh, she just gave only three examples. Uh, yeah, that's that's right, Masoma. So you're you're getting too far ahead. We got to do one step at a time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So she does the yams, the head hunting, the trance. Remember, mystic trance. Okay. All right. So yeah, and that's true, Masoma. I mentioned that in this outline. Okay, so why does she think it's important to study small isolated cultures? Because the yam culture and the headhunting culture are small and isolated cultures. Why? Because they represent an internally consistent set of values and they provide an alternative to American mass culture. What does she hate? She hates when Americans say, you know, everything that Americans do is normal and everybody else is immoral or wrong or inferior, right? That's really annoying to her. Uh, I don't know if the rest of you get annoyed by that. Uh, American arrogance. But anyway, does everybody understand that point? That that's the reason she's doing it. Wake up. For American students, there's other cultures that are perfectly good cultures. They're internally consistent. They function very well. So get over your cultural superiority complex, right? Her conclusion, morality differs in every society and is a convenient term for socially approved habits. Got it? Get it in your head. The examples she uses, homosexuality, mystic trance, paranoia, the yam, yam collectors, yam seed collectors, and the headhunting. What is true of those examples? So Masoma, this is where we're getting to your point. They don't simply conflict with Western values. It's not like she goes to, China, to uh, Indonesia and people eat with their fingers 
Whereas in America, oh, you eat with your fingers, you're in trouble. <laughs> and so when I went to Indonesia, I was like, I can't eat with my fingers. But I, I, lo I learned, I taught, I learned how to do it. And before I left, I was like doing it even when I didn't have to, because I thought, ah, it's my last chance. But anyway, so that would be different, right? Oh, they eat with their fingers in Indonesia, and we eat sil with silverware, and somebody eats with chopsticks, right? She could have said that. She did not say that. She deliberately picked examples that conflict with Western values and contradict, right? So in her time, 1934, all of these things would have been considered absolutely morally wrong or degenerate, right? You're not supposed to stare into space. You're supposed to work. Um, what do you think you can learn from those examples? So again, she picked the examples carefully. She knows that they're very clear examples but they're very, very far from the average American. People are molded by culture. Western values are no better. If we were there, we would have those values or we'd have that way of life. Our personalities would be different for the most part. There's no reason why a society selects one way or another. It's non-rational and subconscious. People aren't conscious of it. They just learn by habit. Morality means normality. That's it. So stop, stop calling other people inferior or immoral. Stop, stop, right? What is she against? She's against a false sense of the in inevitability of our values or the superiority of our values. She's against cultural bigotry, right? Being a bigot. She think that attitude is harmful because Westerners have tried to force their values onto other people, imperialism. Does everybody understand that? And I have talked about that, right? Utilitarianism is supposed to be scientific, happiness, pleasure, pain, uh, you know, but it was, these are the philosophies that Westerners took with them and part of their colonialism, right? Christianity, Aristotle, all of those things were used to force, to show, you know, forced onto these developing countries or intimidating developing countries. Um, so she does have this non-relative value, right? She thinks tolerance is better than bigotry. Does everybody understand that? She says she's a moral relativist, but she's she thinks bigotry is bad. Okay. I hope I hope you can understand that. That's going yeah, on. In, yeah. Okay. Her research, she thinks her research is going to improve the human condition by making Westerners aware of their unjustified biases and scientific investigation of other cultures and telling the whole truth will our society because we won't be such terrible bigots, okay? And let me just give you an example of that kind of imperialism. Here, this is, I don't know if I showed you this before, but a British um, army soldier, he goes to India. He says, I traveled across, oh, dang. Wait a sec. What did I do? Here we go. I've traveled across the length and breadth of India. I haven't seen one person who is a beggar, a thief, such wealth I've seen in this country in terms of cultural wealth, such high moral values, people of such caliber. I don't think we would ever be able to conquer this country unless we break the very backbone, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. Therefore, propose we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture, for if Indians think that all that is foreign in English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nation. Okay, we got that. All right. That's what Benedict 
is saying, you know, get over it, don't do that, that was evil, right? Does everybody understand that? Okay. All right, so that's what she's against, right? Her research is gonna break that down and expose the way that we used what was normal in the West and we called it moral and we destroyed these other cultures. And that was evil, that was bad because it's wrong because people get conditioned and blah, blah. All right, I'm gonna save the world, all right? All right, what are the universal problems that every culture has to deal with? So let's start and this, Again, goes back to Aristotle's virtues, but not Aristotle. That was used, again, that was a bludgeon used for colonialism, right? But the reason I teach it, it starts with, remember, pleasure and fear. Those are the instinctual drives. So what is it every culture has to deal with? Food, clothing, shelter, sexuality, premarital sex, um, family life, child raising, aging, health, death, grief, education, arts, religious expression, distribution of wealth, criminality, anger, jealousy, revenge. Okay, so every society has to deal with that, right? Remember, these are a lot of, these are Aristotelian, um, ambition, honor, all that stuff. It's Every society, however, conditions people in a way specific to that society. And in a way, if it's a good culture, all the conditioning fits together. Nothing contradicts itself. So there's this consistent, coherent, integrated. So everybody born into the society, if they be according to what everybody does in relation to all this stuff, they'll be perfectly adjusted. And so, you know, people are raising their kids. I mean, some, some people ask me, I mean, how are your children becoming adjusted or socialized or whatever? <laughs> and I said, uh, I want my kids to be civilized, but not socialized, right? Because in my society, to be socialized is to be greedy, which I consider barbaric and uncivilized. But that was, I never said that out loud, okay? Um, so here are, here are the objective problems. What are the specific problems which these four things address, right? Mystic trance addresses public religious expression, right? Religion, homosexuality, obviously every society has to deal with that. The annoying thing had to do with the food source. You're saving your yam seeds for the next plenty and headhunting has to do with how to deal with grief, right? So you can find this common foundation. It's just a variation, right? Are the specific responses non-rational and subconscious? This is a key. Is there absolutely no reason why they have tradition? Or is there a reason? In India, India, um, people faced poverty, war, overpopulation. There was this coming and going of cultures. And so if you emphasize having inner strength and not trying to achieve goals in the external world, you can get people to get along, right? That's what Macaulay noticed. These people really get along, right? <laughs> they take care of each other. They get along. They don't compete. Um, so mystic trance, you know, valuing a very rich inner life is connected to their adaptivity, how they avoid a, a lot of conflict and how they have, how they survive. What I'm getting at is that was a, a really good um, conditioning people in order for people to flourish as much as was possible in that situation at that time. Um, what about Greece? And well, what she said mostly is that it's in small islands where people don't need a lot more kids all the time because you get too many kids, 
then you have to, you know, you get problems with overpopulation. So you could say in places where uh, overpopulation was a problem rather than having a lot of kids being a virtue, uh, homosexuality was accepted because it was a way to prevent too many people, right? So again, it doesn't mean everybody in the society knew that, but it does mean probably somebody knew that or and the reasons for it. You can't say there was no reason, right? The paranoia thing was a way to preserve their seeds for the next season or they'd all starve. Now, whether it had to be that extreme, it's, you know, I don't know, but it certainly worked. And so as long as it worked, it was, so there was a reason for it. And the hunting, people needed to believe that their chief was all powerful, right? So for them to doubt, to think their chief is weak, could really collapse the society. And so he had to do that. Like, Again, he might not necessarily go, I'm doing this to keep my society in, you know, uh, he might just have been taught that's what you do, but it worked, right? It just had to be that way in order for that society to flourish. So you could argue that these habits developed as a way to maximize human flourishing. And Americans don't like it because it would not maximize flourishing in our society, right? We value hard work. You know, we have people working like dogs as if that's so important and making more money. Or um, at the time when homosexuality was considered evil was at a time when people thought more and more kids was gonna increase the economy of our country. Well, it, it was right? You were a farmer, that farming, you have a big family, they can help you farm, blah, blah. Um, and then the seed thing in the U.S. or the West, no way, Jose, that would be very, that would undermine the West. And then the headhunting, right? So you could just say, well, the reason we call it that is just that we have to have just about the opposite in order for us to flourish, but it's exactly the same standard, maximizing flourishing. Okay. Professor, could you please yes. explain the paranoia concept again a bit oh, more? Oh, they just think everybody's out to get their seeds. And so they don't like other people, right? They don't trust other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then there are certain universal temperament types, introvert, extrovert. Uh, those good old Myers-Briggs. I don't know if you guys take those tests. Do you guys do the Myers-Briggs introvert, extrovert? I mean, for fun. <laughs> yeah, okay. But you know what it is, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that has a history behind it too. Um, that was originally created for corporations so they could make more money. Okay, everybody know that? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's not as if that's the be all and end all either. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, okay, what is the purpose of society, right? Is the purpose to meet human needs and realize human potential, right? To develop capabilities, or is it just to mold people into conformity for the sake of survival, just because? You know, we have to be unified in order to survive, or is it some combination, right? Okay, and that's for you to think about. Um, what, okay, here's, here, you have to follow this. I want you to think about this because she is totally contradicting herself and not aware of it because this is such a popular line of reasoning. And I'm, and you've probably already swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. So be careful, rethink. All right, what's a good society? Well integrated and consistent with itself according to whatever values it's selected, right? All right, what are the problems? Her conclusion is morality differs. All it means is socially approved. There's no reason for cultural selection. 
It's non-rational and unconscious. People learn by habit. Based on data. Okay, here's the philosopher talking. According to her, how does the human mind think? Well, kids observe, people observe, they observe other people's behaviors, and they draw generalization, they imitate, they figure out what are most people doing most of the time, and then they do it. Every, I hope you understand that. What sorts of non-inductive thinking does she think is either impossible or irrelevant? Everything we've studied so far, guys. <laughs> Aristotle, because it's based on a theory, a view of the human condition, not observing, you know, very few societies actually follow that model, right? You're not going to get that by just observing. What about Augustine? No way, Jose, right? That comes from in here. What about Aquinas? Eh, okay. What about Kant? All right. And then what about Locke? Locke's view that we're all born free and equal. Nobody observes people being born free and equal or acting free and equal. Freedom and equality are not what you observe, right? Okay, I hope everybody's got that. Then, what sort of inductive thinking does she think is impossible or irrelevant? John Stuart Mill's higher and lower pleasures, right? I don't see it. Where does he get it? It's just him talking about himself, right? And then the value of a free and open society. She's, she doesn't, you know, that's not what you observe when you look at the facts. That's your imposing Western values, right? Ashlyn, you've been totally corrupted. You, you've, you're, you've been turned into a freaking Westerner, you naughty girl. Like, go back and get better condition. Go home. <laughs> but I mean, you got to get this. That's not based on empirical data that a free and open society makes people happier or that that's what they do. It's much more compelling to say people learn by habit and imitation and they want the approval of other people and they get socially conditioned. Do you understand that, Ashlyn? Yes, Professor. Okay. The value of being exposed to other positions, the freedom to pursue any other... This is exactly the opposite of a well-integrated society, right? Exactly the opposite. Okay. Well, how does the conclusion in number one, that morality is just socially approved habits, follow from her view of reality? Well, in all the questions of good and evil, people just get socialized. What they believe is whatever they were socialized to think like Bentham, you know, they're like herd animals. Remember, <laughs> pleasure and pain, it's all really whatever, you know, whatever positive and negative reinforcement they got, right? If she's right, if, if all we are are these little herd animals that look around and figure out how to fit in, what characteristics would the best societies have, okay? Well, they select for traits that reinforce each other, right? So, you know, if, you, if you're selecting for patriarchy, male domination, you better have your, not let your daughter talk back to you at all, even at age two, right? I mean, get her conditioned. And um, actually Rousseau said that Sophie, a girl, you should start her from when she's young, interrupting her all the time. Because then she's get used to that. Because when she gets married, she's going to be interrupted all the time, right? Don't let her focus on anything. Because then she'll be much better at being a good wife and mother, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And that's what Benedict is saying is a well-integrated society. You've got to get this. She's idealizing this kind of society, right? Traits that reinforce each other. They maintain the same values from one generation to the next. Back in the good old days, you know, let's do it the way grandpa did it. 
come on. <laughs> it's you're corrupt if you think anything new, right? It's coherent and internally consistent. Everybody's comfortable. Nobody questions it. Okay, Masoma, go ahead. Uh, professor, I'm wondering if she mentioned about those values and norms, what kind of norms and values we should be integrating? It doesn't matter what they are, right? They can be par uh, yam paranoia or they can be headhunting. It doesn't matter what they are. But it then why is she criticizing USA, Professor? I mean, they, <laughs> they are not. So if uh, this is the way that they are, you know, in their societies and their norms and they are integrated and well. So why she's criticizing that? Ah, you're, I mean, you, you read the, yeah, that's right, Masoma. That's what I'm getting at. She's contradicting herself totally, but let's go through it, right? She says, don't you criticize those headhunters, right? They all agree. Everybody's, you know, happy with it. It works. You don't criticize those yam seed collectors. You don't criticize, you know, you're just a bigot if you do that. You're a cultural bigot. Okay, okay. Now, what, if she's right, if she's right, this is her, I don't agree with her, but if she's right, what will destroy a society? Change, right? Interaction with other groups. Introducing new behaviors and beliefs. So the experience of the next generation is unintelligible to the elders. That undermines internal consistency, right? Introducing behaviors that conflict with traditional beliefs. So the new generation has to reject their elders, not just different, wrong, right? That's going to break down the whole coherence. Introduce them without calling them morally good or better, but just different. <laughs> All right? So the younger generation says, I'm just not going to do it your way just because I don't feel like it. So there. <laughs> okay. That's her view of what not to do. And that's what she just did. Does everybody understand that? Um, she did the very thing. She said that if you want an internally coherent society where people <laughs> are society, you don't do this. Um, professor? Yeah? I just have a tiny question, and that is, according to her, is colonialism or imperialism justified? What I'm going to argue is that she hated it, right? Except yeah did it she also did it <laughs> okay that's what i'm getting at if you just hold on for a sec okay yeah she hates what macaulay said right we're going to destroy this society because it's better than ours and we have to conquer it right she that's what she thinks she's saving the world with but as a matter of fact somebody could argue she's actually just another wave of the same thing Okay, so just hold on a second. Given her view, right? <clears throat> if she really wanted to strengthen Western society, first of all, she wouldn't go abroad. I don't want to go and I don't want to study primitive people. We're superior. Why would I do that? <laughs> okay, so uh, she would present other societies either as extensions of our own. So. If she is well integrated into her society, she's a cultural bigot. She'll say, oh, well, actually, they're sort of like America, so they're not so bad. Or they're more primitive because they're not like us, like we're the best. And that would reinforce. So the reason I went abroad was just to make sure what I already knew, which America is number one, right? Given her view, not my view, her view, if she wanted to weaken American society, what would she do? She'd force Westerners to recognize other cultures as different, but equally valuable, say that the people are plastic and can be molded in any way. This undermines our cultural integrity, right? And that's why you have a lot of religious people in America going, those blankety blank secular humanists, those moral relativists, meh, meh, meh. And... <laughs> 
they even said when 9-11 happened, there was this huge movement. Jerry Falwell said, God allowed 9-11 to happen because our country was getting taken over by the moral relativists and the gays and the feminists. He really did, right? Does everybody understand that? He has cultural integrity, right? She's undermining it. Oh, good. I'm glad you get that. What does she think she's doing to save the world? Get rid of Western bigotry, right? But on her view of human nature, what else is she doing? She's destroying Western culture, right? If she's right, we can't get past empirical generalizations. Then societies are either chaotic because everybody lives differently or else whatever most people do, what's morally right, okay? All right, so let me, if she's right, then when Westerners go into developing countries and say uh, some people are naturally homosexual and undermine your cultural integrity, right? We're being moral bigots and we have a superiority complex and we're destroying the integrity of your societies, right? Same with sexism. Like those Westerners, those blankety blank feminists, they come into these developing countries and they tell women that this isn't their place and they completely destroy our culture, right? And um, those blankety blank secular humanists say that religion is backward and primitive and they completely undermine our integrity. And it's just another kind of colonialism. They're colonizing the minds of the young people. Ah! And AUW is one of the worst. Let's go get them. Let's go get our pitchforks and our torches. And that Professor Beck, oh my God, we gotta go after her. Okay. <laughs> but the thing is, I say a plague on both your houses, right? Benedict is wrong. And then mindless cultural bigotry is wrong. But Benedict is a mindless cultural bigot. She doesn't even know it because she really feels like she's saving things and she's not, she's colonizing. Okay, okay, so Sabikun <laughs> seems to get it. And so I'm gonna ask each of you, if you, do you understand this, that she is so saturated with the value of critical thinking that it doesn't even occur to her that when she idealizes the value of mindless herd instinct, she's, she's, <laughs> she's using critical thinking and implying that it's superior. <laughs> even though she says it's not, right? I mean, that's how conflicted people like this are. And um, it's really, psychologically, it's very unhealthy. <laughs> okay, so Ashlyn, do you understand this line of reasoning? Do you know how she says she's not a bigot and yet she, this is a really powerful force of bigotry? Uh, yes, Professor. So what I thought, as you have already mentioned, is that uh, she is thinking that she uh, she thinks that she is saving the world, but she, what actually she does in the other side is another form of a colonialism that she actually disagrees. Right. So that in itself shows the irony of her, irony in her idea that. Uh, what the what she does is completely against, like unconsciously going against to her idea. So that's the generalized idea I got from the. Very good, good. What about you, Diana? Can you understand what I'm trying to say about her, her way of thinking? I completely agree with Ashley too. I was thinking about kind of same. Okay, so in your own example, right? AUW is telling women they have more capacities, right? Yeah. And the UN is coming into your countries, right? With their capability model. And they're destroying, they really are, right? They're, except, except that, how do we justify it? Well, those are inferior. They're not based on the truth. Whatever, except you're a bunch of relativists. So why don't you just leave us alone? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, everything's relative except you guys are wrong and we're better, right? Uh, okay, um, Isabel, what about you? Okay, what I think I'm gonna do is give everybody another 10 minute break to sort of digest this. And then you can come back and I will call on each of you. Um, and then the next reading, if I don't get much time to talk about it, it really is about sexism and it's about the UN and capabilities and all that stuff. So that's where we're going, but let's take 10. I have 19 minutes after. So at 30 minutes after, uh, be back and have something written down. And I would advise you to write this down because then all you have to do is go to your post and type it up and it won't take you, you know, more than 10, 15 minutes. Just get it done, get it over with, move on. Um, all right, so take 10 guys. Professor, I want to say something. Sure. Sorry. Uh, Professor, you don't need to send the links as I'm uh, getting from your YouTube channel. So I will put on the Excel sheet. So you don't need to send email for that. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I'm free. I probably will just because it's so easy. And I, but I'm so glad you're doing that too. And um, I'll tell you, Diana, even if none of the students come to it, just for me to keep that in my basic memory bank of what I do oh. in case, because I'll have another class where there isn't a Diana. And if yeah, I, it's fine. Doing it, okay. It's just for my habituation, right? I have to be a mindless herd animal and just habituate myself to do it. And it's okay, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for doing it. it. Really, I'm sure the students are very grateful. Okay.
So a friend of mine gave me this cup. You like my cup? Yes, yes. <laughs> she was, um, she teaches chemistry. Mm -hmm. husband teaches math at the school where I used to teach and they're from Sri Lanka. Oh. And they were some of my favorites. Um, but they always, whenever, like, we would, we would have these potluck dinners because I can cook and they can cook really well. <laughs> so I just bring some store-bought things so that I can, you know, kind of like my uh, ticket into the, into the fancy restaurant. And um, she always gives people such wonderful gifts, right? She's giving me these mugs or she gives me um, really nice soaps or stuff. I mean, it's incredible. And I guess that's her culture, you know? And it's just the American in me is into this cost benefit analysis stuff. Like, oh my God, it's Puritanism. I mean, it is, it's uh, Americans on the one hand, they're self-indulgent. And so they spend money unnecessarily. But on the other hand, they have, have this other sort of repressed side to them. And uh, that's why you have on the one hand, you can tell Americans are conflicted because one time, at one moment, they're saying some politician is awful because of his sex life. And the other minute they're voting for Trump, you know, they're just unbelievably conflicted about these things. But anyway, yeah, my friend, um, Erosha. I don't know if we have people in this class from Sri Lanka, but I definitely go there someday, visit her family, and I hear that it's beautiful, so. Um, all right, I think we're ready. Okay, Isabel, did you have a comment on Ruth Benedict and her conflicted psyche? Okay. Um, Let's see. Masoma, did you have something else you want to say? Uh, no, Professor. I'm like, I'm agree with all the contradiction you pointed out. And then, yeah, those are valid. Okay. Marjana, did you have something? Nope. Um, Rita? Okay, now. Professor, did you call me? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, professor, I did hear all your voice, so uh, I don't know. What did you ask about? About the discussion, I think. I'm sorry for this morning. My connection was at work very well, so I did hear all your explanation. Okay. Saida, did you have anything? Uh, Pooja? Let's see if I have. Yes, Professor. I, 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 was, I, was, I was listening to the comments made by Ashley and I, were, and I was agreed on that. So I don't have any comments. Uh, for now, but if I'll have, I'll let you know. Thank you. Sure. Fatima? Nope. Um, Fardeen? Um, I'm still processing what you said, Professor. I want to read it thoroughly once before... Um like forming a detailed opinion on it. But what you said kind of reminded me of, so for a previous course, uh, it was um, an anthropology course. Uh, we studied cultural relativism and um, yeah, we talked about some anthropologists and this reminded me, your discussion reminded me of that. Um, they're like 
there was this culture of anthropologists in the like when that uh, like in the beginning of that field where they would go and study these other communities and um, that thing you said about uh, I'm trying finding it difficult to find the words right now but like them contradicting themselves uh, when there's yeah I'll express it better in the post uh, <laughs> I have to process it a bit more right good. Well, just in general, they want to get over Western bigotry by going to these tribal places and showing, you know, that everybody's well adjusted and they sort of idealize that. But if that's true, they're not, then they're undermining whatever remnant of culture that we have in America, right? They're just making it worse. Um, but on the other hand, they, the other extreme would be they literally go there in order to change it because it's primitive, right? And they're going to try to wake up the primitives. I remember a girl years ago, this is decades ago, she went to India and she gave, you know, she did her little survey, which uh, those surveys I think are so crazy because I mean, you ask people questions and people don't even know, like they don't, they don't know that they're ignorant. <laughs> they don't know. I, I just, anyway, she asked, she started asking women um, things like, things like, do you make your husband do just as much housework as you, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you're asking women for whom they never considered that. So supposedly you're morally relative, right? But you're actually imposing a whole lot of values. Like you're dropping a bomb into their culture and you're doing it because you consciously or not think your culture is superior, right? And to say that, no, no, I'm just morally neutral is just, it's, it's not intellectually honest, <laughs> right? I mean, if you really wanted the societies to have their own integrity, you wouldn't come anywhere near them. Um, and if you really want to get rid of Western bigotry, what you're doing is actually completely destroying whatever remnant of an integrated culture you ever had. <laughs> but, so let's move on and say, um, now I want you to think about this because as a philosopher, I think based on just evolution and the evolution of the brain and it's thinking and it's thinking about thinking that there's this natural development and that critical thinking is a good thing, but people abuse that right? Once you get to realize that ideas are powerful, you can use ideas to do some really emotionally primitive stuff and to, and to um, make a society fall apart, right? So, so when Mr. Macaulay, you know, deliberately came into India and with his Aristotle and his Christianity, you know, and said, you know, we're superior to you, deliberately destroying the integrity they had and reducing it to a more survival level so they couldn't survive as well. And so then they had to depend on the West to do it for them. And, and then you add, yeah, and we have better values than you too, because we have, you know, phronesis and we have the Greeks and all that stuff. Um, that that's intellectually dishonest and it's wicked, right? Um, but if you idealize these societies in a way that you sort of infantilize them and you don't want them to re-examine their own culture in any way, you know, especially at this time in history. So I think at this point in history, there's some really important things going on. 
because uh, globalization has completely covered every square mile <laughs> just about in the whole world. And societies in ancient times were much more sustainable, but they were agricultural based. Then Western industry and science came in and told these cultures, oh, no, no, you must value science and technology and tractors and GMO and all that wonderful stuff. And we just happened to make money on it. <laughs> but of course, it was all in the name of progress and having a better culture. And then, but now, right? Everybody's gotten into the habit of a very high fossil fuel lifestyle. And so developing countries, people in developing countries are aspiring to having heating and air conditioning and refrigerators and all this stuff while life on earth is really, <laughs> I don't really think we're gonna last, frankly. I don't think life is going to last. But if it does, we have to adjust, right? Everybody's got to change all their habits and go green, right? And so, and we can, right? We can, but we have to think critically. We have to get beyond our habituation. Um, and the trouble there is that people could see analogies. They could say, well, the West told us we should have the green revolution meant tractors and technology and you know genetically modified uh, organism, all that stuff. And that is just leading us, you know, to becoming greedy and to destroying our own ecosystem. But now they're telling us, oh no, no, no. Now, you know, we're superior because we're green. And, you know, and the developing countries are saying, wait a sec, you got to develop by exploiting natural resources. So it's now it's our turn to, to use our resources to get a higher standard of living. And you can go green, but we get to have, you know, we get to finally use our resources for our own people. Um, so, or, so, I mean, it's complicated. It's just that the bottom line is that every society needed to have some respect for the natural world it was, it lived in the midst of, right? And so during the era of science and technology, we learned how to exploit nature. And so we developed this attitude that technology will just save us. It'll just find another way of exploiting nature to make up for that other way, right? And then we'll do just more technology. And there's that's just not going anywhere. Um, so at this point, everybody has to change their habits based on reason. Does that make sense? And we're capable of it. We can do it. But, um, and you can, and what we're going to do for next time is use some models of, of the psyche. So the question from a psychological point of view, how plastic are we, right? Are we 100% plastic except every once in a while there's somebody like Eeyore with a very grumpy disposition, <laughs> right? There's a melancholic disposition. There's a cheerful disposition. Other than those basic dispositions, most people are just plastic. So, so in terms of psychology, I want you to, right? Think about that because you're writing about what is a healthy psyche, right? And um, is a healthy psyche one that adapts and internalizes and perpetuates the internal co consistency and coherence of its culture and reinforces it and applauds it? Or is a healthy uh, psyche one 
that that re-examines all those habits in the light of reason. It doesn't mean you reject them all. It just doesn't mean you accept them all. It just means that you have to, you decide whether to accept them or reject them based on uh, universal truth, right? Now, wait a sec, is there universal truth? Well, um, most societies that ever have ever existed have conditioned people, at least for the last 6,000 years, condition people to accept male domination, that men are by nature superior, right? That's a lie, right? <laughs> so most cultures have been based on a lie. Now, most cultures, most people who have ever lived spend most of their energy, most of their life raising kids. It takes huge amounts of energy. Somebody had to do it, women were doing it. So you could argue that all that sexism in the past was basically just a way to survive, just like the head hunting, right? You had to tell women their place was in the home just in order to get them to spend all the time they had to spend to take care of all the kids they would need. Okay, Masoma, go ahead. I mean, uh, professor, uh, so yeah, I don't want to be sexism, but then when I was hearing about this, that men were superior than women, uh, I was thinking that is it isn't it the opposite? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are strong. really corrupted, Ms. Soma. You have really been corrupted. I mean, my goodness, <laughs> some raving feminist has gotten to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, honestly, the professor, I don't know scientifically, they are, uh, I think it is, it was proved that women are, you know, emotionally strong and then they even, because women are able to use their, uh, I mean, their right and their left side of the mind at the same time, which men are not able, and then women can, women, uh, men cannot do, you know, uh, two talks, uh, two things or two talk, tasks <laughs> at one time that women can do then we are superior. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Masoma. Now you're, okay. So one of the reasons why I persist in my study of Greek culture, even though it's not trendy, right? Most people in the profession are what privileged white males who are completely left-brained and sit in their offices and self-stimulate and only talk to a few other people, right? That's not what the model is, okay? And I, the reason I persist is because, yeah, I have had a complete life. I have raised kids and I have done a lot of community stuff. And I, have, and I do think, right, I always, women connect what they learn to life, right? That's how it was with the Greeks. They never split off the left brain but in the modern world, they did. Look at Kant, right? Talk about a male psyche, right? And look at um, even utility Bentham. He sat in his study by himself and you know talked about calculating. He wasn't out there in the street doing this. And David Hume, all these guys in the modern era talked about freedom and equality but as a matter of fact, they hardly got outside their house, right? They didn't have anything to do with people. And um, so I do, I mean, I get that from Soma. Um, I even understand that when people are reading papers in my profession, I know right away that guy has never taken care of a kid for a week, right? Or he wouldn't talk like that. Um, but anyway, so... Um, there are a lot of good arguments for saying that women need to run the world at this point in history because all the problems are very complicated and interconnected and women are much more uh, uh, adapted to that because when they raise kids, like you can, their brains, especially after they've been pregnant and their whole body chemistry changes, their brains are oriented and I know I had three kids like you just, okay, just like the mother bear, like who's, who's out there going to get my kid, you know, 
And so you're just completely connected. You know, are those teachers reliable? Is the police, uh, what about the neighbors? And so, yeah, I mean, there's lots of good arguments that women ought to run the world at this point in history, especially after men have such, done such a bad job of it. Um, but I, and also the relating to nature, men have used their reason to just control nature. They've been, you know, they just take, woman hating and they make nature into a woman and say nature is out to get us you know we got to have more technology and that's not the way to solve the problem um the thing is Masoma, <laughs> that it probably isn't the best place to start <laughs> to just you know intimidate you know make a bunch of guys angry uh but i do think um at least there's absolutely no reason to think we should, we, there should be any kind of inequalities, right? And everything should be based on proving yourself. It should be based on merit. Uh, the, yes. The Soma? Yes, Professor, it makes sense. Um, and then you have to study all the ways that what appears to be merit really isn't merit. Um, like if, it appears that if you take the SAT in my country, I don't know, you have sort, some sort of big exams you take in high school, is that right, to get into college? In the USA, if you're going to a good college, you take the SAT, but if your kid takes a sample test and doesn't do well, you can pay a tutor $7,000 and get a higher score. And so then you get into a better college, right? I mean, it's not based on merit. And um, what the teacher, what the tutor says, you pay $7,000 for a tutor. I, not, I never did this, but I- Stop read, thinking. Yeah, stop thinking. <laughs> so what I wanna tell some of you actually, it's very possible that one reason you're freaked out about this class is because I really want you to think, and it's possibly that you've been trained not to do that. And so it's possible you're scared of it, but it's possible just unconsciously, you just don't know what to do because you were so rewarded for not thinking. Um, so I hope, you know, I just keep trying to break down that barrier if that's one of the problems. Um, but, I, but, the reason why it didn't seem so hard at AUW when I was there is because all of you have had to think outside the box in terms of sexism, or you wouldn't be at AUW, right? So there's certain respects in which you do think outside of the socialization, but maybe within a classroom setting, right? You've been conditioned in a certain way that this class just doesn't fit in it. It produces anxiety. So I, again, I understand that. I just don't know what else to do. I'm not going to not do that. And so now at least I can explain to you, right? Where I understand that this is a Western value, critical thinking. I understand that um, there's, there are arguments against it. There's reasons because it's a tool and it can get used for good or evil. And it's, it's a difficult tool, right? So if you want a marriage where the husband and the wife make each other accountable and go outside the box in terms of how they're gonna plan her career and his career, juggling family and career, that takes a lot more mental energy and it takes a lot of emotional maturity. It's a lot easier just to fill a role, right? Those, those roles made life easier. You didn't have to like your spouse. You didn't have to agree with them. You just play your role. And if you get your girlfriends you hang out with at the park and your husband gets his male friends he hangs out with at work, it just makes it easier. So, so I think a life based on critical thinking is harder. And there's lots of reasons why societies would be threatened by it. Uh, but... I just think the genie's out of the bottle. Like, we can't go back. We can't pretend women aren't equal <laughs> because it's too many people 
have made that obvious. And, and my country is having a real hard time with the equality of African Americans because white people have done everything possible to deny it, to prevent it. And the too many African Americans have gotten too much opportunity and they're professionals at every level. And like, there's this desperate reactionary move, right? But it's not gonna work. So, but that's gonna be more complicated than the relation between the races is going to get more complicated. Um, but, and so, so I do, I do want you to think about that. That critical thinking doesn't mean you get to say no, you know, you get to question everything. It's, as long as you understand, it's a lot more work to live and examine life than it is to just fall into some kind of socially accepted norms, right? And so, so, you know, women's equality is based on nature. That's what we're doing next time. No matter how much societies try to condition people, the equality of women keeps emerging because every time a little girl is born, she can figure out, I'm just as smart as that little boy or I'm smarter, right? And so, you know, the average kindergarten girl knows that and doesn't, a lot of them don't even know that that's rad, that that's, that that's evil to think that, you know? But I mean, societies in the past have sort of beaten it out of them or got them to kowtow, but it's just not gonna happen. And the same with race and the same with um, homosexuality, right? For a long time, homosexuals did think they were perverted and evil and all that stuff. And, and after a while they go, well, I'm just as good a citizen as that person. I'm faithful to this person and they're cheating. And, you know, I mean, pretty soon it becomes obvious that it was a lie and you, you can't hide the lie. And so, the tr so what I wanna suggest is that there is such a thing as human nature and the human condition. And no matter how much social engineering tries to get superimposed on it, it's dysfunctional and it, it can only work for so long and then the truth will come out. But within a context, the headhunting works, but after a while, especially now with globalization, there is gonna be a certain kind of universality of values, but, there's, but, but that's gonna get all covered up with greed and power and colonialism, right? And so you have to just constantly make distinctions between is AUW really trying to help women, help other women and help developing countries? Or is it just another kind of colonialism and they're taking the best and the brightest and getting them to get their butts out of their backward primitive countries and come up, you know, and work for, and, you know, some other superior thing, is there gonna be a brain drain? That's a problem, right? They don't wanna go back home because, you know, this new world is so much better. So, so as long as you understand that there's no cut and dried answers to this stuff, it's difficult, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I do think AUW has a great mission, but um, it could fail to carry out its mission in a lot of different ways. Um, so that's the one thing. The other thing is as a philosopher, every single lecture I've given you, you can understand, right? When I talk about Aristotle's virtues, you can intuitively understand the difference between what's evolutionary right? Anger, too much, too little, and then every society conditions one way or the other, right? When I did the UN Declaration of Rights, all of you come from different countries, different religions, different blah, blah, blah. You can get it. Then when I talked about um, Augustine's proofs for God, I mean, students were surprised. Yeah, I mean, it's a line of reasoning, 
And so we have stuff. <laughs> I mean, we naturally reason about stuff, crazy stuff, right? Eternal truth and all sorts of crazy, nutty stuff that animals, animals don't argue about stuff like that, right? We're not herd animals. I mean, we're more wicked than a herd animal could ever be. And we're also more virtuous, right? It just, this power of reason gave us this tool for good or evil. And then when I talked about Aquinas, you could understand that, the union of reason and faith. Even if you're Hindu or Buddhist or a total flaming atheist, you can understand it. And um, so now, and then with, with Bentham, you could understand the herd animal point of view. You can understand the Kant point of view. And now I'm just trying to show you how do you put all these together? And Benedict and the, the Western moral relativism has had a big impact, but it appears to be, you know, culturally sensitive and liberal. And actually, it could be just another round of colonialism, right? Getting, okay. The other thing about it is, I'm going to have, I'm assigning you to read a book called Nomad. And this woman came from Somalia. <clears throat> and she ended up in the Netherlands where these secular humanists, in the name of toleration, they want the Muslims to have their own culture and their own place. And she's saying no, because it's so sexist. It's evil, right? She's, she thinks Islam is evil, right? <laughs> it Because the sexism in it is hopeless. And so she wants, she doesn't like all that tolerance. She thinks that tolerance is going to destroy free and open societies because these intolerant people will take over. Well, I don't know if that's true. I just think it's something to think about, right? I want to throw as much stuff at you as I can so that you'll think about it because I, again, I want all of you to end up in a different spot, but the philosopher is going to say that critical thinking is a good thing, <laughs> that a healthy psyche is aware of complexity and ambiguity, intellectually honest, is not going to try to find a silver bullet, is going to be willing to examine and re-examine things, is going to want to grow all the time, um, is going to want to admit what they know and don't know. But that takes a certain level of commitment and emotional maturity. And, um, you know, I don't know. I really don't think democracy is going to last in my country. I, th I think it's going to die. Um, because there's too many people in my country now that don't want to be intellectually honest. They want to be arrogant. They don't want to be patient with complexity and ambiguity. They want things cut and dried for them. They want moral absolutes. They want good and evil to be a lot clearer than they are. And they want to blame the liberals <laughs> and the college professors and um, there's too many college professors that want to live in their silos and not talk to people they don't agree with. And too many professors are corrupted by money and status. There's too much. Um, and when the scales tilt enough, you're going to end up with authoritarianism. But, um, but um, the reason I mention that is just I want you to know we're all in this together, right? Just because I'm from America doesn't mean you should be more like me. That's not true. <laughs> like America in the COVID, I hope, has given developing countries uh, a reason to have second thoughts and to just know that there's no country that's going to be the silver bullet. Um, I really like Biden a lot. And we do have a lot of 
Department of Labor. We have bureaucracies in Washington that are filled with really good people who could get much more high paying jobs, but they really want to preserve the rule of law and the distribution of wealth and, and decent conditions for workers and environmental protections and all this sort of stuff. So we still have a lot of that, but that we don't, we have citizens that, that don't comply or abide by it. And um, it's sad to watch something good sort of moving toward authoritarianism. Now in your countries, um, you're moving maybe away from authoritarianism, but maybe not, right? So I just want you to think critically to what extent do the politicians say they're democratic, but they're not? To what extent do they really not have that much choice? Because if rich guys come in with their contracts, they can't say no because there's too many poor people around. Um, just just uh, have a free and open mind, right? I really do like John Stuart Mill's free and open society. And I like Kant's, what is enlightenment? Think for yourself. But I do think it requires a certain level of maturity. And I do think that all the students at AUW have enough maturity and intellectual training that they, they can do this. You can do this. And if, if you think the reason why the class is calling you uh, causing stress is just because you've been conditioned to, to do what you're told or to get some right and wrong answer and try to think about what the class really is about, right? It's about free and open inquiry. And, and you know, I hope you can get that. Um, so for next time, um, let me show you for next time because obviously that was a problem also. So. I do want you to do a post, right? There was one post about Kant. So that's way back. This was the applications of Kant. So that would be the second half of the Kant post, right? There's one post on Kant. Okay. Then there's one post on Benedict. Um, and, and then, and then I, you know, in my paper, I refer back to Aristotle, but that's beyond page 14. So you don't have to read it. So for next time, we will talk about this. This is John Stuart Mill's argument for the equality of women. I really like this argument because he takes the method of empiricism, of looking at facts and drawing a conclusion. And he uses those kinds of arguments to prove that the society would be better off if it went through this radical, radical, radical shift of treating women as equals. So you have to understand, treating women as equals is a more radical shift. It will undermine social stability more than any other change, right? Because you're taking 51% of the population and completely changing their roles. So that's certainly one reason people would be threatened because most people cling to conservative values because they're afraid, afraid of change. Um, um, okay, let me see, where was I? Oh yeah, so John Stuart Mill uses those tools to sort of argue for this radical change. You have to picture in Victorian England, you know, his, his male buddies say, I've never met a woman who's interested in politics. Like women just don't care about politics, right? And he's going to say, I think it's conditioning, <laughs> right? Have you ever met one that's actually had any sort of education in politics or, you know, right? So he's, you know, he's trying to start with that assumption that people are plastic and that, the reason why women seem to be this way is because they're conditioned to be this way. And then he has to make this argument for everybody would be better off if they were treated as equals. 
And um, all right. So I want you to pick your two most favorite arguments from that outline for one thing. That's one assignment, all right? And one of the students' favorites, can't choose this one now. If women really are unequal by nature, go ahead and give them all this equal opportunity and they won't take it. Like, what are you hiding? <laughs> Right? It's no problem. Just provide it and they won't take it. How come you have to prevent them? Well, it looks kind of suspicious because maybe they actually will be good at this stuff and then they'll compete with you. <laughs> and you might not feel so good about yourself. Anyway, so um, I want you to go through that. And then the, the thing that's interesting is that a lot of my students at Lyon, all right, that works. They agree with sexism is bad. Then you do race, all the same arguments, the same lines of reasoning and the same argument against it, right? And my students at Lyon, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. Then I do homosexuality, all the same arguments. And they go, nope, nope. That's different. That's different. <laughs> so I just say, ah, well, you can think what you like, but this is the standard liberal argument, right? It's using scientific reasoning. It's using empirical methods to argue for radical social change. And I do want you to think about that because Ruth Benedict assumed if you use empirical stuff, you will end up with this internally consistent, well-integrated society, which hates change, right? Change is terrible. And so what, what you realize is you can be an empiricist and still end up with entirely different ideas of the good society and where to go from here. All right, so that's one, that's, and again, you can pick your favorite argument from each of those outlines. Then I have a paper I wrote, not very long, 12 pages, 15, 14 pages, okay? And I think, I think my writing is pretty easy to read. I don't like jargon. I, you know, so I, sometimes I forget that I use big words, but I, I think in general, compared to most scholarship, it's pretty easy to read. Um, and then I have an outline on that. So I would like you to pick your favorite. So each of you needs to come with two of your favorites about women, subjection of women, one favorite about race, one favorite about homosexuality, and at least one favorite argument from my paper right? And between that, that can be your post as far as I'm concerned, right? That's, so if that's what you write, want to write in your post or then fine. And then during the class, just, I'll give you time during the class. Okay. Anything anybody said in the last 20 minutes you want to put in your post, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to write it down, right? So basically, by the end of the class, the only additional time you need is the time to type it up and then your final reflection, like what's my takeaway? So the post should not take very long. So let, let me just explain to you from my point of view what it looks like to me. It looks like I have you read 14 pages and I have you go through some reasoning Pick some stuff. That should take an hour, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half. And then afterwards for the post, half an hour. So from my point of view, it doesn't look like it would take more than two hours. Does everybody at least understand that? That I try, right? I try to take my share of your time and not more and not less. 
because I don't want to water down the quality, but I, you know, I, whatever, I don't want to intimidate you. So it's time to go. You can go if you want to stay and um, have questions. I will actually turn off the recording here. <laughs> I remembered and then um, I'll send it to you. So, okay.